All right, this is part two of TIG welding basics. Part one was a, a big, big overview where I showed different applications and lots of them for TIG welding. So that, that video was part one and it was intended uh, to give a big, big overview as well as to gather a whole bunch of questions. So in this part two, I'm gonna answer as many questions as I can that came from that video before we move forward into actually, you know, doing the the real basics and running beads with and without filler metal and all that. We're gonna cover TIG torches, filler metal selection. There's a lot of stuff to cover here. So actually I need another welding machine and it's on its way to compare machine controls uh, on the panel. I need to have two contrasting units to do a really good job on it. So I've got one on the way, but so this video is strictly answering the questions that came in off the first video. And we're gonna not just answer them, not just FaceTime here. I'm gonna clip in some instructive arc shots that I have in the archive vault. And uh, we'll try to make this an interesting video answering those questions. Let's go. In your videos, how close is your tungsten to the puddle? when uh, doing TIG in AC and DC current. It looks like you're actually touching the puddle, but we all know if it was touching, it would be smoked. That's my biggest problem. I get as close as I can, but when I add rod, I run the risk of contaminating the tungsten. All right, here is a shot of uh, TIG weld using the lay wire technique. This is on a big chunk of 4140 steel, and I'm leaving the rod in the puddle, so the height of the puddle just really doesn't change a lot. And so I can hold a really tight arc and hold a consistent tight arc. But when you're dipping rod in and out of a puddle, like right here, I'm just running a bead on plate, that puddle height grows. And so you can see subtly I'm kind of raising the electrode up while I add rod. To get it out of the way. Here's another little shot of aluminum using a tapered electrode. I can get right down in there really really tight but if I were to start adding rod to that keeping a tight arc I'd have problems and so I'd do something like this. I pause and raise the, elect uh, the electrode and torch up just a little bit lengthen the arc while I add rod to compensate for the, the uh, puddle height growing. Same thing on a butt joint just like this. You can see I'm holding a really tight arc in between dips and I'll slow it down here so you can see it really well but as I add rod I know that puddle height is going to grow so I might as well pull my electrode away a little bit and I clean a lot less electrodes that way. I think if I had no knowledge about welding this would be too complicated. You should have explained some of the terminology and basic function of TIG welding. Well we're going to do that and it's going to come later. I might have got the cart before the horse but whatever. All right, when using backing to build up a hole on that wheel or the bad milled part that you showed, is it possible to use graphite as backing? I've known a few gunsmiths that use graphite for small threaded screw holes to and then they just run a bead around it and then they're able to just knock that down and it, it saves on a lot of work. Graphite, graphite is carbon basically, so you gotta be concerned about that. So if you're welding stainless steel, you're gonna, you're gonna risk carbon pickup and that's not a good thing for, for stainless steel. Uh, it just depends on the application, but it can be used for backing on certain materials, mostly ones that can tolerate a little bit of carbon pickup. For this aluminum job here, this is a big chunk of aluminum I pulled out of the scrap and did a little mock-up repair on it. I use a big chunk of stainless steel for backing, a big solid piece of round stock. Sheet metal wouldn't work, it would melt, it would get too hot, but stainless steel works really well for aluminum backing because number one, it's, it's not thermally conductive very much, so it doesn't draw a lot of heat away on something that you'd really need you know, to put a lot of heat in. On contrast that with stainless steel where you're not, you really would like to pull a lot of heat out, so I use copper backing on stainless steel, like for filling in holes like this, mispunched holes, misdrilled holes that need to be relocated, and you want to save the part. Using copper backing is just almost as good as using argon backup gas for a weld like this. Pulls heat away, traps argon instead of letting argon flow around that edge and uh, prevents distortion by pulling heat away and just works really well. And copper, for most stainless steels, a little copper pickup is, is not a real big issue. Have you ever tried scratch start TIG with an AC stick welder for aluminum? My first welding machine was a buzz box and then I traded for a high frequency start unit 
and uh, it could weld aluminum, but man, it was not, it wasn't any good. And the a high frequency generator unit typically costs several hundred dollars, two or three hundred anyway, even on even on Craigslist or eBay. And by the time you buy that and a few other things, you're better off just you're better off putting your money into another TIG welder. All right, here's a question. It's just a comment. It says, "Love the uh, TIG Finger XL." You know, in the in the, in the part one, we uh, introduced the TIG Finger XL for guys that want to slip two fingers in. You know, my I, my size, I'm I'm uh, I don't have little hands, but those guys that have huge hands, I can slip two fingers in a TIG Finger XL with a TIG glove on. And so some guys though need the TIG Finger XL just because they got the Hulk hands, and uh, and now we got it. So not to be overly commercialized here, but here's just a quick pick showing you the difference. The TIG Finger XL is quite a bit thicker, quite a bit larger, and so let's move on now. Could you go over tungsten size and selection of different tungsten choices relative to different materials and different job applications? And I'm going to go over this in detail later, but let me say this. Let me just say this. 90% of everything I do for videos and job shop jobs that come through the shop, 90% um, of it can be done with a 2%, 3, 332nd lanthanated electrode and a number 7 gas lens. 90%. Now I've got all kinds of TIG cups, I've got all kinds of TIG torches, micro TIG torches, 17, 18, 26, um, air cooled, water cooled, flex head, all kinds. 90% of it can be done with a setup similar to this. This is a 17V with a stubby gas lens 7, seven uh, cup on it. And a 332nd, 2% lanthanated electrode. 2% lanthanated, I've done a lot of testing on it, and it's 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 my go-to. I just, I, I got, I don't use anything else. It simplifies life. I don't want to have a box full of different color-coded electrodes, so all I get anymore is 2% lanthanated. Even, it's even a lot better than 1.5% lanthanated. I've tried them all. I've tried laser. I've tried E3. I've tried 2% thoriated. I used to use that for years and years. I never have really liked pure. We'll go into that later when I go over electrodes in depth, but just just know that if you, if you just want to, you know, set it and forget it type information, there's a tip for you. 332nd, 2% lanthanated electrode and a number seven cup with a gas lens set up and you can take care of most jobs. When I walk the cup or not, my filler rod usually balls up and comes out of the puddle. How can I avoid this? Well, number one, there are several things and we'll clip in a little video clip here in just a second to come and demonstrate the right way uh, and talk about what can happen. but. Number one, you need to use the right size filler rod. If you use too small a filler rod, it will just melt and ball up. If you use too much torch angle or too much arc length, what happens is it creates a big heated plume and it melts the tip of that rod too much. And so tight arc, don't use excessive torch angle and keep a little pressure on the rod uh, into the puddle and you should be okay. Let's look at, let's look at that right now. This is using a 1 8 rod, keeping a little pressure on the wire so that it stays in the puddle and keeping a pretty tight arc. And by doing that, the rod doesn't ball up and doesn't come out of the puddle. Now, just because you walk the cup doesn't mean you're always going to use lay wire technique. You can walk the cup and dip like I'm doing right here. I'm using a 332nd uh, filler wire. Here, I'm doing everything wrong. Long arc, too much torch angle, and too small a rod probably, and it's balling up and falling in there, and it's not ever even getting down into the root of the joint. That's no good. Contrast that with this, where I'm using a nice tight arc, not that much torch angle. The rod is metering in very precisely to the puddle. I'm going to buy my first welding machine soon, and it's just going to be a DC, uh, a DC TIG unit. Here's my question. What's the pulsing function mainly used for? And uh, could it be useful for a hobbyist or an engineering student? Here's the answer that I gave this guy. If you're a beginner TIG welder, take that money you were going to spend extra for a machine that's got pulse on it, buy some metal and filler rods and, and get some seat time. That's going to do you way more good than pulsing would. Pulsing helps a little bit, and it only, it only usually helps once you're at a certain skill level. What you're looking at here is pulse welding using 33 pulses a second. 
33% on time and 33% background current. I call it the rule of 33 and it works great for welding on or near an edge, but it's not completely necessary. You can do it without pulse. Here's a good one. Jody, you bastardo, why didn't you come out with a TIG Finger XL earlier? I bought a regular one and really like it, but totally would have bought the XL if it were an option at the time. Sorry. <laughs> Came out with it because people asked for it later on after they use the regular TIG finger. So it's available now. Next question. I do a few cast iron repairs, uh, mostly for farmers or on older antique farm equipment. For most of them, I generally braze using oxyacetylene. I was wondering if TIG brazing with aluminum bronze or silicon bronze would work as well. You can, a lot of times you can get by TIG welding with aluminum bronze or silicon bronze on cast iron jobs. Preheat and slow cool still is just as every bit as important and a little bit more important. With oxyacetylene brazing, you're actually keeping that part hot with the heat of the torch and so it creates a slow cooling uh, situation. So when you're TIG welding, uh, you, you need to preheat and you need to keep it hot. So if you have to weld a lot, you might have to stop and, and heat it with a torch again. But it, it can work, definitely. Aluminum bronze, a lot stronger than silicon bronze. And when I do, when I do TIG welding on cast iron uh, with aluminum bronze, I use AC, just like I would aluminum, except I turn the AC balance up to where there's uh, very little cleaning action to direct the heat a little bit more. And here's a little example of that. I'm using uh, cold rolled steel here just for a test piece. And I'm using alternating current, aluminum bronze filler. You see I'm using a tapered electrode and I've got the AC balance set to very little cleaning action. But it doesn't take much. Just a little bit of cleaning action will clean up that aluminum in the aluminum bronze puddle and make it look really nice. Let me show you a little close up of that. The technique is just wash it forward just a little bit because this is actually TIG brazing. And then get back over the puddle while you add rod. Jody, I've noticed your, your tungsten tips are sometimes sharpened to a point and sometimes a full semi-sphere. How do these shapes affect a weld? Well, they do affect a weld. The tungsten geometry, the tungsten prep, does have an effect on penetration and bead profile. But when you're watching my videos and you're seeing sometimes I have a tapered electrode on aluminum and sometimes it's rounded, sometimes the only reason is I'll, I'll sharpen the electrode to a little bit less of a taper than I would use on steel and I just let it ball how it ever, however it will ball uh, because I want a good crisp start like on a corner and edge and it gives me a nice crisp start at low amperage with a taper on there and then as I increase amperage it balls. Now sometimes it balls more than I really want it to but as long as things are going okay I just keep welding. A good example of, of this is just this little job right here where somebody got really a little aggressive with a bandsaw in cutting off a little piece off this aluminum part. And so I needed to build up that with aluminum rod. So I wanted a nice crisp start on the corner. And what I do is I light up before I ever puddle. I watch that black stuff cook away. See it cook away there? I'm not puddling yet. And then I add, add a little uh, amperage and then I get a good clean puddle. But see, I got a nice crisp start, and I'm at low amperage here on the corner. It's not; it doesn't take much amperage to weld and melt aluminum on a corner like this, especially card, uh, starting on the very corner. And then I I weld inboard and let it heat up a little bit as I go. I've still got a very stable arc, even though I taper down to very low amperage there. Bring it over here and do the same thing. This this piece is heating up now as I go. It's like preheating a little bit by itself because I'm welding on the corners where it doesn't take much amperage. And then as I come inboard here, things wash in pretty nicely with just a little bit more amperage. And see the electrode's still got kind of a taper on it. It's, doesn't, it's not balling up excessively. And so it's a very stable arc. I'm, I'm able to place metal pretty much where I want it. And even when I taper down to taper out and not leave a crater, you can see it's still not wandering very much. The arc is still pretty stable. And having to light back to add a little extra rod, still got quite a taper on it and it just goes pretty well. That's a pretty common repair. Now, same thing here. I want a tapered electrode here if I'm welding on an edge weld, like on a boat prop repair using a piece of copper for backing. Pretty low amperage. My main concern is a nice crisp arc start for something thick like this part again this is a thick aluminum part takes a lot of heat 
like I'm going to set this machine up to pretty much 200 amps to to weld this thing, and I'll I'll control with a foot pedal. But my main concern is not low end arc starts. It's the just a stable arc that wraps around and makes a nice wide bead because I'm just doing a lot a lot of build up here, and I don't want nodules and fingers on the end of the electrode that might spit off into the weld. Now this is a low frequency weld on really thick aluminum, one inch thick aluminum. It's set at 50 hertz, and that tip just kind of flattened out like that. For DC, the thinner the metal, the kind of the sharper you want your point. You want a needle sharp point on something like these box cutter blades. That'll help you get a nice, crisp, low end, low amp start. And you also want to use a small enough electrode. This is a 1 16th electrode, but sharpened to a needle point, it's, it does a pretty good job on these box cutter blades. They're about 25 thousandths thick, but I'm welding on the sharpened edge, so it's a lot thinner than that. As opposed to welding on a chunk of thick steel like this, I don't sharpen the electrode near as much. This is a 332nd electrode, and it doesn't have a needle sharp point on it. The way you get your penetration with TIG is by joint preparation. Welding on thick, thick metal, you can just only penetrate so deep. You need a chamfer if you really need deep penetration. All right, well, that is about it for this week's video. Again, I've got the TIG Finger XL in stock and available ready now. Also, those stubby gas lens kits that you saw me using earlier in the video. And we'll see you next time.